I have been hoping to have this for weeks now. We are finally there. It is something I'm calling thousands or billions. And the issue is I, I want to do these kinds of things more regularly. This is just the first of several. And what I want to do is I want to get people on the air and have them defend their positions and give the very best arguments in defense of their position to attack the other position, give the best counter argument, and then give each side a chance to uh, to rebut and respond to those. Now, you can't do the whole thing in, in an hour show. I get that. But what you can do is surface some of the stronger arguments and certainly surface what you think is at stake on this. Now, the reason I'm calling it thousands or billions is there are a lot of Christians who love the Lord. In fact, both of the guys I have on today in, in, in this debate or this discussion, they both love the Lord. They're both Christians. They both believe in inerrancy. They both believe that the Bible is God's inerrant word. They are both hostile to naturalism. They're both hostile to naturalistic evolution. And they are both trained in astrophysics. And they both differ strongly on the issue of cosmology, the age of the earth, the age of the cosmos, the age of the universe, etc. And so that's why the name thousands or billions. Dr. Hugh Ross is founder and president of Reasons to Believe. He is both an astrophysicist with a Ph.D. from the University of Vancouver, as well as a pastor. He's written uh, over a dozen books, including his latest, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And Hugh Ross will be defending the old Earth position that the Earth and the cosmos are five billion years old or around there. Defending the young earth position is Dr. Jason Lyle. Jason Lyle's with Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis Ministry. He is also the designer of the Creation Museum in Cincinnati. And Jason has his Ph.D. in astrophysics from the University of Colorado. And Jason's latest book is entitled The Ultimate Proof of Creation, Resolving the Origins Debate. Now, guys, uh, Dr. Ross, Dr. Lyle, welcome to the Frank Pastore Show. Here, here's sort of the ground rules. And, Jason, I'm going to let you go first. I just said you're both Christians, you both love the Lord, you both revere the Bible as God's inerrant word, and you, you both are trained in astrophysics, but you differ on, on cosmology. Is that, that's true, right? I mean, you're, you're a Bible-believing, on-fire, Bible's the word of God Christian, right? That's right. Okay. And, uh, for the record, I don't doubt uh, Hugh Ross's salvation or his uh, conviction for the Lord. Uh, this is not a salvation issue, but it is a very important issue. Right, and that's the spirit that why I wanted to have both of you guys on is to lay this out. So, Jason, I've asked you to go first, and then we'll have Hugh respond. But take a few minutes and lay out why you think, when you look through a telescope and you see the, the canopy of stars out there, that you see thousands of years, not millions or billions. Why is that? Okay, well, first of all, I would argue that it's the clear teaching of Scripture. That is, if we're reading the Bible in an exegetical fashion, reading out of it what God has placed in it, we can come to no other conclusion than that God created supernaturally in six ordinary days, and that this happened a few thousand years ago. God makes it clear that he created in six days in Genesis uh, chapter 1, for example. This is reaffirmed in Exodus uh, chapter 20, verse 11, where it says, In six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the seed on all that in them is, indicating that everything that God made was made in the span of six days. It's clear from context those are ordinary, approximately 24-hour days. They, they wouldn't be ages or anything like that, because each one is bounded by an evening and a morning, words that are always used in an, in an ordinary sense. And there's a numbered list there, the first day, the second day. It tells us what God did on each of those days. In fact, uh, Exodus 20.11 is actually giving us the reason for why we have a seven-day week. The reason God tells us, remember the, in the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and God tells us in six days you'll do all your labor, but the seventh is the Lord's. He gives an explanation for why that is, and it turns out that it's based on God's uh, creation. And so if God created over millions of years, boy, we'd have some work week, wouldn't we? You'd all right, never so, make it to the weekend. All right, so Jason, you start from Scripture, and right. then now as you look through the telescope or a microscope or you look around, everything has got to fit that initial grid. That's fair to say? Uh, I would say yes. Okay. Everyone has a, a worldview through which they interpret the evidence. Now, some people are not aware of their own worldview. I'm, right. I'm at least conscious of my own worldview. I know what it is, and I'm able to compare it with other worldviews. And I find that the biblical worldview is the only worldview that's ultimately rational. So there is no evidence that you could be presented that would overturn your idea that it's six literal days and thousands, not millions or billions. There's no evidence possible in astronomy, biology, physics, etc. So it's got to be six days no matter what the seeming evidence would appear to be. 
well, since we all interpret evidence in light of our worldview, somebody would have to challenge my worldview in order to convince me otherwise. Okay. And I think that's theoretically possible, but they'd have to show me where I'm, I'm wrong in the Scriptures first. Okay, no, I get it. And, and I want to make sure that, you know, as my friend Dennis Prager says, I want clarity, not agreement on this, but I just want to make sure your view gets out there in, in a fair light that you agree with. So Dr. Ross... Uh, Jason just said that he starts from his, quote, Christian worldview, and he starts from the text. And I'm wondering, where do you start in your belief that as you look through a telescope, you see millions or billions of years, not six literal 24-hour day periods or thousands of years? Well, the most common misperception is that we at Reasons to Believe do not take Genesis literally. We do. We believe God created all life on Earth in six literal days. The Hebrew word yom translated day has four literal definitions. Part of the daylight hours, all the daylight hours, a 24-hour period, or a long but finite period of time. And it's the last definition that best fits a literal and internally consistent reading of all the biblical creation accounts. And the lack of an evening and a morning for the seventh day, for example, shows us that that day is not yet ended. So just coming straight from Scripture... I realized right from the very first chapter it's teaching an old earth, an old universe. On the other hand, I'd be quick to point out uh, that uh, we also hold that the entire human species is descended from Adam and Eve that lived only thousands of years ago. And we're only talking about the events before humanity, not the events that follow after humanity. There we have a fair amount of agreement. All right, so you also would say that I b- also believe in biblical inerrancy, that it was, you know, six literal days, but they're not 24-hour days. Is that fair? That's fair, because almost every Hebrew noun has multiple literal definitions, and that's why I believe God gave us over two dozen creation accounts. So we can go to Job and Proverbs and Psalms, uh, which are three accounts that actually overlap the six creation days, and see which reading, which literal definition of Yom allows us to read the entire Bible without contradiction. All right, so you Not you're, have to take the Bible literally; you have to take it consistently. Right. All right. So your position is Yom has a variety of meanings, not just a literal twenty-four hour period. And yes, you aspire to take the Bible literally as well, but you take Yom to be a period of time rather than a strict twenty-four hour period. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, good. So, Jason, your response to that, because Dr. Ross said there are a number, two dozen, creation accounts in the Bible. Would you agree with that? Do you see those passages as not referring to the original creation and to something else? Well, clearly there's one creation account in the Bible, and that's what Genesis, uh, Genesis 1 is referring to, and, and chapter 2 being an application of the, the events on, on day 6. Now, I certainly want to interpret the Bible consistently, but I, I don't agree with this uh, notion that we ought to integrate all 763 accounts of creation, and that's that's not the case. And uh, it, it's as if you know Hugh keeps finding these new uh, truths in the Bible that no one else in history seems to have noticed, and that alone ought to make us suspicious of that view. Well, that it, well, that raises an interesting. I'm, I'm sorry, there's no way to avoid you know rabbit trails on this, but. What has been the historic position, Jason, you go first and then Hugh, what has been the historic position within the Christian church? Has it always been, quote, a young earth position, Jason, from day one? Has it gone through different dynamics? I mean, you know, what what is the history of the age of the earth problem for, you know, Bible-believing Christians? Well, clearly the uh, the normal uh, view, the normal understanding is that that God created in six days, and in fact that is the basis for a work week. That's the way the, the Jews understood it. And that's been the normal position. Now, there have been some exceptions to that. I'll be the first uh, to concede that. And uh, that's fine. But you see, you can't call, for example, these, these other passages in scriptures like Job or Proverbs or Psalms, you can't call those creation accounts. In fact, there's two problems with calling those creation accounts. One, they're not creation. And two, they're not accounts. No, no, that's fine. But you see, they're not creation accounts because they're not uh, giving us a... Um, they're not, they, they sometimes reference creation, but they're not primarily about creation. I mean, the Psalms, for example, is a book of uh, poetry, but oh. praises to God. All right, Jason, let, let, I want, I'll, okay, hold on, I apologize, but there's, again, there's no way for me not to interrupt you guys. So, so, Hugh, Jason says these are not creation accounts, and before you answer that question, give me the history of the Christian church with regards to old earth, young earth. Has it always been young? Jason says that it has been. That's been the traditional understanding for, in Christianity for 2,000 years. Is that true? Would you agree with that? Well, I, th- I think he's not saying that. He is saying that uh, there's been dispute over that uh, throughout the ages. It's something that we debated extensively in a book called The Genesis Debate, uh, pointing out, for example, that 
uh, you really don't have the early church writers uh, making the definitive dogmatic statements that you see going on today. Uh, in fact, there's only two pages of commentary in the 2,000 pages that, that the early church fathers uh, wrote on uh, Genesis 1, only two pages that deal uh, with the uh, length issue, and they're quite vague. The first specific statement you get in the uh, literature is from Isaac Newton, and uh, he, d he comes out strongly on the old earth perspective. So that's the first time in history, and incidentally, that's before evolution even uh, raised its ear. Uh, more than uh, 300 years ago, you got Isaac Newton uh, making uh, that a particular statement. But I would strongly dispute the idea that Job and Psalms and Proverbs are not creation accounts. If you look at Job 38 and 39, the entire two chapters are dealing uh, with creation. They actually address events on all six creation days. Psalm 104 has been recognized for centuries as a creation psalm. And there are actually several creation psalms. In Psalm 104, the entire psalm uh, deals with uh, creation history. All right, so let, let so me I stop you right there. To integrate. Oh, no, no, I understand. So, Jason, your rebuttal to that. Well, okay, Psalm 104 is not an account at all. It's, written in, uh, it's not written in the historic narrative style. Rather, it's written in a poetic way. And that's something that Dr. Stephen Boyd, a Ph.D. A Hebrew scholar at the Master's College, has confirmed. The way the literature is arranged is not, uh, it's not something that is historical narrative. Now, it certainly references creation a number of times. That's fine. If I went out tonight and I said, boy, the moon, you know, maybe, maybe the moon's really pretty tonight, and I said, boy, look at the moon which God created. Am I referencing creation? Yes. Is that a creation account? No. Because, you see, I'm living in the present, and I'm looking at the moon in the present, and I'm uh, pointing out that uh, God created it in the past. Now, Psalm 104 very clearly is not a creation account because it refers to things that exist in the modern world. For example, if you look at Psalm 104, verse 26, it talks about, it says there are ships moving along. Mm. Now, is that referring to uh, creation? Were there ships moving along at creation? Clearly not. And so this is talking about how, how God cares for the present world. And by the way, the word creation can mean, to, it can mean, it can refer to the creation week, or it can refer to what God has created. For example, if I made a beautiful sculpture, and I said, come and take a look at my creation, I'm not referring to the act of me creating, I'm referring to what I created. Psalm okay. 104 is praising God for his creation, what he has made. And there are references to, to the beginning. But that's not what the psalm is entirely about, and you can see examples of that throughout. In fact, it talks about the lions roaring after their prey. All right, well, Jason, um, let me interrupt because we've got to take a break. We're going to come back, and uh, we're going to continue this discussion between Drs. Hugh Ross and Jason Lyle in something I'm calling Thousands or Billions. It deals with the age of the Earth and the age of the cosmos. And what I think is fascinating is they're both astrophysicists, and we went immediately to the text in understanding what the Hebrew word yom, Y-O-M, uh, what that means. Is it a literal 24-hour period, or does it have other meanings? And they differed on the different, quote, creation accounts. According to Dr. Ross, there are a number of creation accounts in the Scripture. According to Dr. Jason Lyle, there's only one in the book of Genesis. The other ones refer to creation, but not the act of creation. Interesting distinction. We continue we'll continue. There's more ahead. A lot more thousands we or billion. And joining us are Drs. Hugh Ross and Jason show. Lyle. Hugh Ross, founder and president of Reasons to Believe. And Jason Lyle is with Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis out of Cincinnati. Both PhDs in astrophysics, both love the Lord, both believe in biblical inerrancy. Uh, they're not, you know, theological liberals or anything like that. They're both hostile to evolution, uh, but they disagree strongly on the age of the Earth and the age of the cosmos. Jason, uh, we had started with you on the in the previous segment, so Dr. Ross, we're going to start this time with you. Here's the question: In the previous segment, we spent almost the whole time talking about Hebrew. Yet you're both astrophysicists, and so I want to get in your strong suit, which is dealing with your field of study and expertise, which is, of course, astronomy. So, Hugh, when you look through a telescope, uh, what do you see? Do you see thousands or millions or billions of years in the distances between galaxies and stars and all that kind of stuff? Because I think most people just want to understand, okay, what do you see when you look through? My hunch is... You see billions, and Jason sees thousands, but I don't know why. So what do you see, Hugh, when you look through a telescope? You see thousands or billions? Well, just to wrap up on the last section, uh, if you go to our reasons.org website, we give you every verse in the Bible that deals with creation. We recommend that people read all those before they make up our mind. But, you know, Jason and I agree on a lot of things. We both agree that the Bible teaches that the universe has continuously expanded from a cosmic creation event an actual beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. The Bible also...